So for some three decades after its original German edition in 1962, Habermas's book had virtually no impact on historians in any language or national field. Indeed, the international resonance of its author's other works among social scientists also proceeded largely independently of the standing of that earlier book. Um, in the English-speaking world, Habermas's reception was defined far more by his renewal of critical theory, which culminated in the two-volume theory of communicative action, translated in 1984. Thereafter, each of Habermas's publications came into English virtually immediately from his disputes with French post-structuralism and an important collection of interviews to the many volumes of um, the philosophical political writings and the major theoretical treatise between facts and norms published in 1992 and translated four years later in 96. Amid this reception, the book on the public sphere remained the only one of the earth not to be translated into English. Even among the rising generation of historians in West Germany itself, who during the 1960s and 1970s were self-consciously fashioning a new historical social science, partly under Habermas's influence. And in fact, Hans Ulrich Wehler, the grandfather of that new social science history, had been um, Habermas's junior in the Hitler Youth, I think. I think I'm remembering that correctly. So there are kind of all sorts of connections there. But even for that uh, generation of West German historians, uh, Struktur Wandel der Öffentlichkeit also mattered far less than the various works of critical epistemology, which in contrast were invoked with talismanic regularity. For many years, access to Struktur Wandel through the English language was gained mainly via the translation in 1974 of a short encyclopedia article on the public sphere in an early issue of New German Critique, a journal that also pioneered the earliest discussions of um, his idea more generally. During the 70s and 80s, to my recollection, virtually no historians were writing in consciously Habermasian ways. Even the advocates of Habermas's centrality to critical theory showed little interest in these historical arguments. Remarkably enough, John Keynes, Public Life and Late Capitalism, published in 1984, which was avowedly inspired by a reading of Habermas, makes no extended reference to Struktur Wandel itself. Similarly, Keynes, two volumes on the discourse of civil society in the 1980s, which strategically captured the political momentum of that extremely important European discussion made no connections to notions of the public sphere as such. And I spent some time like mapping out that um, early non-reception, so to speak, because the explosion of interest in the public sphere, formally speaking, since the early 1990s is a very interesting phenomenon of contemporary political discourse, it seems to me, that's worth thinking about. So in the 1990s, this suddenly changed. Uh, I'm now talking uh, about historians again. A first sign was Joan Landers' stimulating book on women and the public sphere in the French Revolution, joined around the same time uh, by Leonor Davidoff and Catherine Hall's Family Fortunes, Men and Women in the English Middle Class, 1780 to 1850, and Mary Ryan's Women in Public, between banners and ballots, 1825, 1880 in the US, uh, which problematized the public versus private distinction in a gendered analysis of their subjects. So here, we're already edging closer to the problematic outlined in Craig's lecture yesterday. But the real impetus came from the belated translation of the book itself, Struktur Wandel der Öffentlichkeit in 1989, powerfully reinforced by the published proceedings of an accompanying conference, of which Craig, of course, was the organizing editor. And since then, Habermasian discussions have sort of broken out all over the map. In the process, the concept has migrated a long way from its original usage. Aside from its general currency, 
among historians and across the humanities and social sciences as a term of theory, public sphere has become adaptable for widely varying purposes. After the early proletarian public sphere proposed by Necht and Kluger that Craig mentioned yesterday, we now have the black public sphere, the feminist public sphere, professional public spheres, the phantom public sphere, the title of a very important uh, volume of essays, the global public sphere, the indigenous public sphere, the intimate public sphere, the electronic public sphere, and so forth. The burgeoning new journals in cultural studies have aired these discussions during the last quarter century, mobilizing work across the disciplines from literature to anthropology, philo philosophy to musicology, history to communications. Moreover, even the most casual visit to the internet reveals an extraordinary profu profusion of activity around the term, ranging across national and linguistic borders, inside the academy and out, across all manner of disciplines and fields, from poetry to psychoanalysis, law to markets, television to cybernetics. And it's actually really interesting if you do that kind of search, because it shows that this is like um, not remotely uh, merely an a pre preoccupation of academic intellectuals. And that's also interesting, it seems to me. It doesn't happen very often that you know a, a, a term of theory in the in the academy migrates so promiscuously across the public sphere, right? So in contemporary discourse, public sphere now signifies the general questing for democratic agency in an era of declining electoral participation, compromised sovereignties, and frustrated or disappointed citizenship. That's how I start to make begin making sense of the you know the, of the contemporary interest in this the proliferation of interest in this term. The term seems to be called upon wherever people come together for collective exchange and expression of opinion, aiming both for coherent enunciation and the transmission of messages onward to parallel or superordinate bodies, whether these be a state, some other institutional locus of authority, or simply a dominant culture. Such publics might be local and extremely modest, as in the public sphere of a particular institution, like a company, um, or a university, or in the actions of citizens in a special part of their lives, uh, such as parents mobilizing at school boards, or they may be spatially quite indefinite, as in the novel publics of the cyberspace, transnational diasporas, and everything associated with what we now call globalization. The term's value has long separated itself from its more specific uh, beginnings. Habermas himself now deploys the concept, if you read his writings of the last 10 years, um, now deploys the concept in relation to citizenship and democratic legitimation more generally using it to express, quote, the equal opportunity to take part in an encompassing process of focused political communication, unquote, and the need to fashion a resilient, what he calls communicational infrastructure toward that end. It now functions as a mobile theoretical term analogous to state or society, and as such lends itself to contexts widely varying from the Western European ones Habermas originally discussed. So in the rest of, of what I'm going to say, Craig's talk yesterday might be taken as a series of prompts. Uh, I mean, the talk, had I had the text ahead of time, might well have been a series of prompts to what I'm going to say now is what I mean to say. <laughs> a series of prompts for considering the relationship between publicness as a normative ideal and the social and political conditions of its realization between publicness as a normative ideal and the social and political conditions of its realization. On the one hand, 
the social relations, social practices, and social histories that both sustain an ideal of publicness in the Habermasian sense, the materialities that enable its crystallization, the structures that ground its sustainable possibility, on the one hand. On the other hand, the macro-political frameworks of states, constitutions, sovereignties, legal orders, institutional arenas, and machineries of governance that both protect individual and collective access to the goods of publicness and enable its translation into agency. If publicness is a normative desideratum that enables engaged citizenship while securing its protections against hostile authority, intrusive policing, legal limitation or violent and coercive suppression. So if publicness is a normative desideratum that enables engaged citizenship while securing its protections, then how should we understand its relationship to social determinations? How should we understand its relationship to social determinations? Question mark. Much of the public sphere discussion inspired by Habermas's book has become highly abstract in that way, implying what Craig calls, quote, an escape from social determinations into a realm of discursive reason. An escape from social determinations into a realm of discursive reason, a passage that Habermas's own trajectory from Strukturwandel to a theory of communicative action also mirrors. So in what follows, uh, I'd like to take, take uh, Craig's reflections on public and private and offer a few observations on how public life tends to be understood in relation to its social foundations. So how public life tends to be understood in relation to its social foundations. And I've got Um, five, five points. Um, first, it's worth emphasizing that Habermas himself originally derived his argument about the public sphere, about Öffentlichkeit, from a series of highly materialist social histories. At a time of extreme uncertainty among social historians, when what we now call the cultural turn was placing them uncomfortably onto the defensive during the 1990s, the book's translation offered an account of democracy's cultural prerequisites that remained grounded in highly materialist ways. The book begins with a particular model of the formation of commercial society for understanding the transition from feudalism to capitalism, embracing all the institutional innovations presupposed in the organization of markets, of communications, of the creation of newspapers and so forth, linking the circulation of ideas to a new infrastructural environment of social organization and exchange. For its time, early 1960s, for its time, this account was impressively based on the social historical scholarship then available, which actually wasn't very much. It was a very thin historiography at that time. It always implied a social history rather than just an argument about ideas. Its beauty was to have theorized the emergence of modern politics in a way that was precisely grounded in materialist social history and a broader conception of public action. In that sense, one uh, recent historian's claim that its appeal, the appeal of the public sphere in the 1990s was, quote, the result of the slow decline of unreconstructed social history and the linguistic and cultural turns in the discipline is, for me, completely wide of the mark. On the contrary, uh, the concept allowed key social bearings and lines of social explanation to be preserved at a time when so many voices were sort of casting them out. So that's the first point, that actually this was all, in Habermas's usage, this was always located in a set of very carefully expounded uh, social histories. Uh, 
materialist ones. Second, and I'm going to uh, shift to the present, there's, there, there is a vulgarized version of uh, this argument that became incredibly widely diffused after 1989-91 in the dominant literatures on democratic transition in post-communist and other societies emerging from what were seen to be dictatorships. And in such cases, the prospects for successful democratization were seen, and are still seen in this literature, it seems to me, are seen to reside in two types of restructuring. One occurring in the economy, the other in civil society. In the first case, the success of democracies tied is tied to the ability of national elites to follow through on a market-centered process of economic reform, thus freeing the economy in that powerful neoliberal sense, freeing the economy becomes the essential precondition for any successful democratic political transition to occur. Likewise, Creating a strong moral consensus based in a resilient infrastructure of social institutions, civil society, is seen to be equally crucial. Without either of these twin foundations, according to this view, democracy is going to fail. It can only be a weak and artificial implantation intruded into societies lacking the civic competence and political culture necessary to allow it to flourish. Democracy, in this view, presupposes deep historical underlying processes of societal growth and cultural sedimentation, which alone can produce the default behaviors necessary before democratic political arrangements can work. That is, the habitus of competent citizenship, which, it's argued, communist societies frozen into postures of administered conformity never had the chance to acquire. Now, that makes democratic success a secondary effect of other histories, it seems to me, whether via the progress of neoliberal economic reform or via the growth of a complex and variegated civil society. Political culture Political culture, or the effective exercise of democratic citizenship, political culture is made primarily dependent on economics, a capitalist market order, and social history, the growth of civil society. And this perspective also reflects a rarely explicated reading of the history of the West, more generally, which means Britain, France, the United States, where long-run socioeconomic development and democratic acculturation are thought to be found. But in those cases, too, as social his historians of those countries will attest, democracy resulted from far more complicated histories of social and political conflict. And in current discussions of democracy, it's precisely these complicated histories of conflict that get ignored. And so the question I want to uh, raise with this second point is, well, uh, uh, where does the Habermasian kind of narrative of the growth of modernity differ from these contemporary vulgarized versions, as I regard them? Third, and here I can actually, I brilliantly anticipated one of the things that Craig did actually say yesterday. Third, um, there's perhaps more ambiguity to the Habermasian concept of Öffentlichkeit <laughs> uh, than much of the English language discussion allows or has allowed. An unwieldy aggregation of terms like publicness, publicity, public culture, and public opinion translates the term perhaps more accurately than the customary public sphere, which manages only a rather clumsy and unsatisfactory approximation of the complicated German meaning. It connote, uh, the meaning, the German uh, term connotes something more like the quality or the condition of being public, it seems to me the quality or, or the condition of, uh, of uh, being public or becoming public, perhaps better, allowing opportunity 
for a set of ethical and philosophical desiderata in addition to the more distinctly institutional arena of political articulation commonly foregrounded by many of the English language treatments, it seems to me. If we consider the implications of publicness within this rather different horizon, the changing coordinates of political life become more intelligible than if we confine ourselves to the more familiar institutional approach. For example, the period since the 1960s in particular simply isn't graspable. You know, I can, the formation of our contemporary world is what I really mean. The, um, the period since the 1960s, for example, in particular, simply isn't graspable using only a framework of constitutional liberalism, parliamentary politics, and reasoned public debate any more than the turbulence of the 1960s and 1970s was assimilable by the already consolidated political culture of the post-war time. In instead, violence, direct action militancy, street demonstrations, the politics of memory, visual culture, the mass circulation of images, and the commercialized and mass-mediated domain of popular culture all require a different kind of analytic from the one offered by Habermas's classic account. These aspects of 1968 exploded the terms of available political discourse. Theoretically speaking, in those terms, they also expose some crucial difficulties at the center of Habermas's own thinking of the time, seems to me. That's third. So the, the, uh, the need to expand the field of meanings that um, Öffentlichkeit slash public sphere has often, has commonly been taken to encompass in the English language discussion, and in very much the ways that Craig um, um, sort of traveled through yesterday, yesterday afternoon. Fourth, uh, given the emphasis on reasoning, communicative rationality, and democratic civility, and now I'm actually, again, you know, radically shifting con context from, you know, the contemporary era to uh, fascism, well, maybe that's not such a radical disjunction. <laughs> Given the emphasis on reasoning, communicative rationality, and democratic civility, how far is it sensible to apply the conceptual language of publicness and the public sphere to societies under fascism, is what I want to uh, ask now. Now, in its immediate wake during the 1960s and 1970s, uh, Habermas's book, Strukturwandel, uh, inspired some extremely interesting discussions of this question among uh, uh, the West German New Left, while more recently, since the 1990s, a great deal of writing has been devoted to uh, Walter Benjamin's aestheticization thesis and the nature of the fascist spectacle. So there are all sorts of ways in which this is, is actually an active discussion, you know, it's the application of, you know, public, publicness, public sphere and so on to societies under fascism, especially Italy and Germany in the interwar years. But I wonder, I wonder how far the destruction of juridical and institutional democracy, uh, the dismantling of civil liberties, the abrogating of the liberal rule of law, the wielding of political violence and state terror, the systematic moral coerciveness of the Volksgemeinschaft, the community, the race, nation, people, I wonder, um, this is a, again a question I, I'm raising for discussion, I wonder how all of these features, the state of exception if you like, I wonder how all of these features simply render the language of publicness nugatory. <laughs> 
No, I mean, can there be a fascist public sphere, in, in fact, in these terms? I think it's an interesting uh, question. Now, one way of illustrating this point is to use one kind of limit case, namely uh, the Nazi occupation of Eastern Europe and the experience of the Jews, for which I'll use the example of the Warsaw Ghetto between 1939 and 1942. So on the one hand, despite the most extreme forms of violent, repressive, and coercive domination, which effectively excluded consensual forms of political negotiation between rulers and ruled, and reduced the subordinate population's autonomies to the minimum, so despite the most extreme forms of violent, repressive, and coercive rule, room was still found in the Warsaw Ghetto for forms of collective self-organization. Ghetto life displayed the most extraordinary forms of creativity in the minuscule space the Nazis left, so that beneath the level of the Judenrat's official governance and the larger public sector grouped around the Jewish social assistance, there functioned a comprehensive network of house committees composing the ghetto's real associational fabric, together with an impressive undergrowth of religious, educational, and other cultural activities, including, crucially one might say, uh, the record-keeping mission of the Oneg Shabbat archive assembled by uh, Emmanuel Ringel Ringelblum. Now, such creativity also had its political dimension because all of the pre-war Jewish political factions and tendencies were present and active in ghetto life. Conservatives, right and left-wing Zionists, revisionists, Bundist socialists, communists, and especially the youth movements of these various groups. Now, this political culture of the ghetto also sustained an underground press, evidence surviving in Warsaw of an astonishing 47 separate newspapers between early 1940 and summer 1942. So all of that is on the one hand. On the other hand, though, uh, of course, this remarkable subcultural creativity made no difference at all once the Nazis began clearing the ghetto in July 1942, despite the efforts of the Jewish fighting organizations act activists in the ghetto rising of 1943. And again, not unimportantly, the constitutive importance of their legacies for the structuring of Israeli political culture later on. The example of the Nazi racial state also illustrates one of the most basic of the grounds of the public-private relationship discussed by Craig yesterday afternoon. Ordinary life under Nazi rules Ordinary life under Nazi rules, whether it's in the ghetto or in, uh, uh, back in Germany under the Third Reich, ordinary life under Nazi rules was so exceptional for the Jews and other racial enemies as to shatter the reliable assumptions of human interaction. Not only were rights, citizenship, and civic dignity taken away, access to careers and education closed, livelihoods destroyed, property seized, but the basic suppositions of living in society, neighborly coexistence and reciprocity, forms of mutuality, respect for opponents, friendship across differences, the kindness of strangers, the basic suppositions of living in society could no longer apply. In that case, how far can that normative language of publicness still keep its pertinence is the question I want, I, I, I'd like to raise in relation, you know, fascism was obviously an extreme case, but there are all sorts of ways in which authority begins to close down the space, you know, both physically and metaphorically, existentially, within which everything that Craig was discussing yesterday, you know, occurs.
right? So I think, you know, uh, thinking about this question is interesting, <laughs> maybe even important. So finally, um, I don't want uh, to finish without insisting on the importance of gender, uh, not least because back in the day, feminist critiques of the Habermasian framework were the most important earliest and most important in opening it up for greater complexities. As both history and idea, uh, those critiques have argued, the public sphere was constructed around a system of gendered meanings, whether in the formal intellectual discourse of politics, citizenship and rights, in the institutional arenas of publicness and publicity, in the associational universes of civic engagement and sociality, or in the personal sphere of family life. More generally, both in theory and politics, feminists have turned the relationship of the personal and the political completely inside out since the late 1960s and early 1970s, making it possible entirely to remake the connections between everydayness and political life whether in the family or the workplace, in sexuality and personal relations, or in all the situations where pain and pleasure are produced. Since that time, the consequences of the changing place of women, changing gender relations, and changing sexualities have lastingly redrawn the ground where politics has to be conducted. As a result of the conflicts and mobilizations of the 1970s and 1980s, neither the transformations of family and household since the 1950s, nor the vastly changed relationship of women to education and employment, nor the startling alterations in attitudes towards women in public, could be kept any longer at bay. Dramatically made visible by the 1960s, the changing European socio-sexual order, in Joran Terborn's phrase, the changing European social sexual socio-sexual order now shapes the political common sense in myriad ways. The active presence available to girls and to women of most ages, varying regionally and culturally across societies, the active presence available to girls and to women has shifted radically during that time. The visibility of women, their legitimacy as public actors has fundamentally transformed, whether in the representational domains of the media, in their recruitment of politics, in their means of physical and symbolic access to public space. The impact of contemporary feminisms, including the wider repertoire of feminist political interventions per se, and the complicated diffusion of ideas about sexual equality and gender equity remains one of the most important of the logics initiated during the 1970s. We may then add the wider changes in sexual practices and sexual mores, whether in ideas about sexual pleasure, in alternatives to heterosexuality, in the crumbling of older marital orders, in the widened legitimacy of experimentation, in the fraying of heteronormativity, or in the general queering of what used to be the boundaries of the permissible. All of these things, you know, are hugely important to how we understand publicness, seems to me. So in conclusion, uh, the reception, deployment, and reworking of the notion of Öffentlichkeit, of the public sphere, has turned out to be, a, uh, you know, during the last quarter century, has turned out to be a very good way of getting from these contexts of everyday life to an idea of political agency and action. The concept's usefulness for me was always about opening up a space in this way to talk about politics without it being subsumed in the conventional institutional understanding of how politics occurs. What I've always liked about public sphere uh, as a theory term, as a framework that we can take from Habermas, 
is that it provides a way of conceptualizing an expanded notion of the political. It forces us to look for politics in other social places. This helps in activating, in activating a sense of ordinary and efficacious citizenship today. The public sphere, in that sense, is a space between state and society in which political action occurs with real effectivities, whether in terms of the local effects or in building a sense of political agency or in behaving ethically in one's social relations and allowing some notion of collective goods to be posed and thereby contributing to wider processes of political action. It's one way of making connections between what we think and do in everyday life, including the personal domain, and the world of politics at a time when such extreme and debilitating skepticism has accumulated about the purpose and potency of such action. When in, when in popular perceptions, politics degenerates ever more cynically into a name for corruption, self-interestedness, and machineries of privilege beyond realistic popular control, publicness becomes a way of restoring intelligibility to the political process. It offers a, a possibility of reclaiming politics for a realistic discourse of participant democracy. At a time of such distressingly extensive political disbelief, of disaffection and disablement around one's agency as a citizen, this language of publicness becomes an excellent starting point for thinking again about what politics is, about where it takes place, and about how it can function as a set of capacities available to ordinary people, and not just to those for whom politics serves as a profession. It allows one to imagine, modestly and realistically, how a sense of citizenship might be re-engaged, whether it's in the publicness of particular institutions like a university or a profession, in some local setting like a school board, a workplace, or a neighborhood campaign, or in the new political communities of the cyberspace. This may even infiltrate the political process more conventionally understood in relation to parties and elections, the articulation of interests, and the presentation of demands in government, although that probably is too much to expect. Thank you. I think that's an exaggeration of what I said. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, and it's not I, I, as you are asking me the question. I, I'm, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think how pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will maps on, on to, onto, onto it. <laughs> uh, I was wondering whether you were thinking that there were effects independent of uh, working through the system that you know, sort of. Well, I, that's that's what I'm. That's really what I'm. That's that's what I'm mainly arguing at the end at the end there, and that's what I certainly think. You know, I think that the accumulation of small acts um, in all of the ways that I I sort of you know briefly described at the end there, um, and you know that really Craig was trying to capture with indirect indirect consequences. Was that the, that was the the, the yeah. Um, the accumulation of small acts is actually enormously important 
particularly as they, as they aggregate across micro contexts, obviously. Um, and I think one of, one of the, the, the more encouraging, I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which you know, it's extremely hard to uh, sustain a relationship of optimism to the future now. All sorts of ways, not the least of which is you know, the world environmental catastrophe, because I, I sort of think that in those terms it's over, right? So leaving aside all, all these different levels in which you have to engage this, this question, it seems to me that one of the most important uh, sources of uh, hope politically, if one is a Democrat, small d, you know, let alone whether you know, you're a more radical kind of um, person, um, one of the most important sources of hope is the degree to which active citizenship can be located and identified all over the place, right, since the 1970s and the 1980s. I mean, there's no shortage of active citizenship in these, you know, kind of micro-political ways and in these local contexts. And every so often, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, Occupy is an instance of that. If we go back, you know, 15 years, the beginnings of the uh, anti-globalization -glo movement, you know, uh, were extraordinarily um, interesting and, and, and um, inspiring until 9-11 kind of cut it off, right? From Seattle through Genoa and so on. And then you, you, after that, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the world wide, um, you know, the pan-global sort of anti-war demonstrations in February 2003 were extraordinary. I mean, in London and, you know, in place after place, there were more people actively on the streets than ever before, historically. It didn't make any difference, right? So on the one hand, there's this, you know, there's, there's this, uh, this, this mapping of active citizenship in those ways. But what we no longer possess, it seems to me, yet, is a means of organizing society-wide political capacities to uh, allow those forms of active citizenship to register politically at the level of national polities and of national political processes, or transnational ones, right? And that's what those socialists and communist parties were so good at doing, you know, for all their, their faults and their limitations. And now we don't have, have them. You know, and that re when we get to the question of fascism, you know, if we b think, as I, as I do actually, that, 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 that in certain kinds of uh, political crisis and in terms of the organization of social relations and social interests now, we are dangerously close to the generating of forms of politics that look like fascism. Well, um, again, you know, those older movements were incredibly important in organizing effective bases, you know, political efficacies that could contain and resist that kind of politics. What do we have now, you know, in, the, in those ways? So I, you know, I, I think we have a, a a really important bifurcation between um, local citizenship, if you like, you know, and, and the production of democratic capacities on the ground, and um, what happens in the polity in these national institutional ways. So that's, so I think both, you know. Webb. the public and what actually happens in 
world. But that doesn't make a difference politically in fact there is a concept of Yes. <laughs> Would you like to say more? <laughs> well, I think I was trying to. I was trying to. Uh, um, I mean, in a. In, 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 well, I think that's where we start. That's where we we begin yeah. because as soon as we, uh, you know, we have. So, you know, the availability of that set of understandings, you know, that Craig was really great in laying out yesterday, is, is a, a really important understanding, uh, uh, sorry, a really important uh, starting point for beginning to act individually and collectively with the kind of efficacy that, you know, I was just regretting that we, 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 we find so constrained now. Doesn't that shift the, doesn't that shift Well, I don't. I, I don't see why it, why there's not simul, simultaneity. I mean, why 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 does I mean it, it's I, I mean I hope that I've been moving back and forth, um, and certainly um, you know when I'm um, thinking and writing more generally when I'm trying to figure these questions out, then I, 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 it's, it's all about the back and forth between materialities, contexts, and ideas. So I don't, uh, again, I don't see myself as having left another ground of ideas in this talk. My comments are a little bit less written out than, than Jeff's uh, and try to respond to uh, Craig's paper on a number of points. Um, I'll try to say a little bit about the embodied and affective dimensions of publicness uh, and, uh, and then I want to concentrate a bit more on uh, media frameworks for publicness, which uh, I think is absolutely central to understanding uh, what publicness and the public sphere mean, and we're living through a, a massive transformation of those material conditions of mediation, uh, material and imaginary conditions of mediation uh, that requires a, a good deal of thought. Uh, so let me start by noticing, uh, just to raise the subject of the affective and embodied dimensions of the public sphere, that uh, publicness as an aspiration is now very, very difficult to avoid. Many of us often try to avoid it uh, when we express uh, cynicism uh, or disillusionment about uh, the current uh, instantiation of the public sphere. Many of us endured the George Bush years with, uh, by means of constant uh, protestations that it doesn't reflect on us and, um, I, and constant uh, assurances to our friends abroad that we're not responsible. Um, but that is an interesting phenomenon, if you think about it, in the long history of publicness. Compare the, uh, that, um, that feeling that we have of accountability for what happens in the public sphere or contamination by what happens in the public sphere or mortification for what is, by what is done in our name um, to the various other possibilities uh, for alienation that have existed throughout history. So um, in, let's say, 16th, 17th century England, in the period of the courtly public, uh, before public became a noun, um, there were a whole range of possibilities, including a substantial body of poetry of the virtues of retirement, um, the, as opposed to the, the public courtly life. That doesn't exist anymore. Um, uh, or the possibilities of desert fathers' styles of spirituality or the ancient mode of philosophy as a way of life a, a drawn apart from uh, the rest of the world. Uh, something uh, about publicness in modernity um, implies a, an intimate, a, a, a wide distribution of intimate belonging that we find very hard to escape. And in, uh, in these conditions, <clears throat> um, you might say that the, the, 
emotional feeling of belonging uh, entails some seductions into sovereign subjectivity. We're continually invited to imagine ourselves as the arbiters of the fates of the world, no matter how deeply and, uh, and powerfully we experience um, our uh, alienation from that kind of power. And uh, in the absence of other languages for retirement or, or desert spirituality or philosophy or so on, uh, alienation from sovereign subjectivity often shows up as failure. So I'm, I'm thinking about those people uh, who, um, who find their insertion in publicness mainly through rhetorics of consumption or entertainment and for whom the illusion of sovereign decision making is, is clearly an illusion. Uh, and um, there's a lot of very interesting work on this problem recently, I'm, I'm thinking of Lauren Berlant's work on non-sovereign subjectivity. Um, but that, I think, really has to be uh, one key dimension of, of thinking about the current situation of publicity, uh, particularly uh, in light of the kinds of problems Craig wants to point to, where we now have connectivity, I think this is his phrase for it, connectivity on a scale that has no public to match it. Um, the Craig's advance, uh, example was financialization um, uh, and global economic crisis, but one might also say climate change or any number of other things. Uh, so the feeling of, uh, of deep uh, structural powerlessness combined with unavoidable interpolation into this uh, mode of belonging seems to be um, the modern predicament. Now, um, I, in order to understand this, I think one has to abandon completely the uh, kind of nostalgia for town hall democracy uh, that we saw in the Dewey quotes. Dewey, of course, in his youth in Vermont had a good deal of experience with this uh, ideal, but um, it has little or nothing to do with what public mean, publicness means in modernity. Uh, and I'll say a bit in a moment about the language of face-to-face -face as a misdescription of uh, privacy um, that is symmetrically related to this uh, uh, failure to understand what publicness means. I think you, can, you can't understand that in modernity without looking at circulating media. And of course, this is something that I've, I've written about, uh, but I, it, it was something that wasn't centrally featured in, in Craig's talk. I mean, I know he, he knows this, and, and I don't think we disagree about this, but there are some interesting um, implications for the, the contemporary when we begin to think about the difference between the modes of print circulation that gave rise to the concept of the public, that is public as a noun. It has a very recent history, as, as I'm sure most of you know, um, and, the, and the more, uh, uh, digitally mediated forms of uh, circulation that we have now. Uh, it's of course crucial to remember that the that the thing the the word public uh, um, described or performed was uh, the ability to take the field of circulation as a social entity. Um, that means that the spatial metaphors that Craig criticized are not entirely inaccurate because um, there, first of all, there are materialities underlying uh, circulation that give it the appearance of a feedback closure as a field of circulation, um, give it the appearance of a metatopical continuity, which is absolutely essential to anything that we might mean uh, by the public sphere. Um, and in the case of uh, late 17th, early 18th century print circulation, the temporality of circulation, the datability of newspapers and magazines and so on, the way uh, responses to pamphlets appeared in succession uh, and you had a kind of uh, stringing through time of, um, of public artifacts was essential to the understanding of the historicity of of public experience and public action. Uh, and the uh, scale of circulation was essential to the ability of public media to create new kinds of stranger sociability. Um, now this is a problem I'll come back to in a moment, the, um, the problem of uh, the indefinite extension 
but also partial closure of the field of circulation that creates a, a, a number of the complicated dynamics that Craig was trying to talk about. I, I'll return to this. I think it's es essential to start with um, the conditions of mediation behind what we understand as publicness, um, and that can mean uh, uh, semiotic analysis of footing, adversivity, what counts as opinion, uh, and so on. Uh, it can mean the relation between um, the rational critical as an ideal and um, all the things that manifest that ideal, like the prestige of argumentative genres, uh, which are, after all, unusual in public media, but nevertheless are taken to, um, to be the uh, the, the uh, exemplary type of public discourse in general uh, in Habermas's uh, reading, register, tone, and other um, indicators of credentialized membership. Uh, th this is something that many of us observed um, in, in way back in the day, uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, when uh, we began trying to think about how is it that um, things like whiteness and maleness get preserved as uh, domains of privilege by this rational, critical form of discourse that uh, begins, as Habermas says, by disregarding status. That doesn't mean, of course, that status is irrelevant. It means that it's present in forms like register uh, and tone and genre. Um, so I agree with Craig uh, entirely that to think about publicness in terms of choice, action, argument, judgment, and decision is to miss much of where the action is, and I agree with him entirely that the, um, the relation of publicness to cultural change uh, is possibly more significant than uh, political decision. But this uh, involves us in understanding uh, the materiality of circulation a bit more. Um, of course, media don't just fly off into uh, the ether and, uh, and blanket the globe. There are national markets, there are routes for feedback or even feedback simulation. There, there's a variety of forms of regulation. Um, all the things that make uh, belonging and membership recognizable in public media, uh, those poetic functions uh, for the constitution of a common subjectivity uh, have themselves a, a certain distribution. <clears throat> the ability to postulate social structure out of uh, uh, particulate bits of interaction uh, is uh, itself highly conditioned. Uh, so, <clears throat> so there, there is a kind of locality and spatiality to, um, to media, even when what they're mediating is a sort of disembodiment and, uh, and, uh, and bracketing of status. Nevertheless, and this is the other side of the, of the dialectic, the key feature of print circulation that made it available for this kind of uh, imagination of the public was the unpredictable extension of its circulation, um, or what we might call a kind of obscurity between um, utterance and, uh, and reception. You do not know the people who are going to be reading what you publish. And, um, and that is absolutely critical. It sets up that dialectic between inclusion and exclusion uh, so that the very forms of uh, belonging and membership that are mediated uh, through public forms um, can also be uh, denounced in light of the, of the norm of inclusion as forms of exclusion. Um, similarly, there is a dialectic between embodied and disembodied meanings of publicness. Um, so there was a question yesterday in the, in the Q&A about where the aesthetic fits in. And I think the questioner had in mind by the aesthetic something um, very specific to art. Um, I don't myself believe that the aesthetic is a particularly coherent category. But if you start thinking about all the forms of uh, uh, pleasure and embodiment and um, uh, and mutual display that are that come under the rubric of publicness in modernity. Think about fashion, for example, the way 
Um, we'll, every time we get up and get dressed in the morning, we are thinking partly about our, our visibility in public space and how that will be read through a rhetoric, uh, some rhetoric of uh, social typification. Think about food uh, and the way uh, everything we eat has been so dramatically transformed even in the last 20 years by the rise of a highly mediated food culture. Um, or I think people actually taste things differently because of uh, the, the prominence of food in public media now. Or song. Um, most people can't even sing uh, songs that aren't uh, mediated through uh, a kind of large-scale pop distribution. Uh, and um, forms of speech. Um, there's a lot of attention these days to things like the rising intonation and vocal fry. Uh, which, of course, get dis distributed and pick up meaning because of their presence in large-scale uh, mediatic circulation. Well, these are forms of publicness, but they're also um, the way people are related to their own throats. Or think about generationality. What it, how do you know what your generation is? Well, there's a great old um, uh, Karl Mannheim essay on this problem that, uh, that cuts through the kind of common sense uh, folk conception of generationality is something that befalls you by a kind of default um, uh, given by your birth date. Um, generationality, as he, uh, as he analyzes it, has to do with a constant uh, public reference to various markers of historicity and belonging, and there is no uh, end point for one generation or another. This is the precipitate of a lot of public discussion. So uh, in all these ways, possibilities of embodiment and ordinary life are created by large-scale circulation in time and evaluated by reference to large-scale circulation in time. Are you retro or, or hip or stodgy or whatever? Those are those are judgments about the pace and field of circulation. So uh, for all these reasons, face-to-face, um, -face, the language of face-to-face -face relations uh, as distinct from mediated ones gets us off on the wrong foot uh, and, and never described that difference, uh, even in the period in which it was coined before all of these forms of uh, mass mediation. Face-to-face um, -face relations can mean anything from the anonymous intimacy of gay cruising to the kind of front stage presentation by which we manage our interactions in uh, institutional settings such as this. Fascist rallies are face-to-face, -face, uh, if you think about it that way, or uh, random uh, passings in the street. So there is no, um, there is no consistent quality of interaction or subjectivity that adheres to the face-to-face -face setting. And, in, and what that, uh, I, that category uh, blinds us to is the way in embodied interaction, people are continually trying to produce in both conscious and subconscious ways something that we uh, might now call obscurity. It, this is something I'll talk about in a moment because obscurity is a um, a term that's getting more and more traction in, um, in legal conversations about the archaic quality of our language of public and private in describing online interactions. Um, but people uh, produce obscurity in all kinds of ways when you manage your relations in one context so as to block recognition of what you're doing in another context or to differentiate your styles of self-presentation in different environments and so on. Um, I think it's only now that, uh, that digital media threaten uh, obscurity that we suddenly realize how much this turns out to be a value for us. Um, the internet uh, theoretically permits us to be anyone. And of course, this was the, the great fantasy when, uh, when the web first came along, is that everyone would develop all of these uh, virtual fake personae, and we wouldn't be able to tell who anyone was anymore. But of course, in the increasing integration of social media with credit systems and data mining and surveillance, 
it is more likely that internet use will reinforce the normativity of offline social structures. Um, now, that is to some degree uh, a, a problem that goes back to print as well. This is not entirely new with digital media. Um, in uh, the late 17th and early 18th century, one of the, after the lapse of the Licensing Act, particularly one of the key features of print uh, discourse was uh, what we might call a, a variety of forms of obscurity. The invisibility of the audience, a state of unknowing uh, whenever you commit something to circulation uh, as to where it will end up, um, a state of unknowing about how the, do the artifacts of public circulation were generated and who's behind them. Um, so, uh, of course, governments get very interested in that when there are problems of uh, censorship and, um, and liability, but uh, print uh, enabled a good deal of functional obscurity uh, in a way that uh, lay am ambiguously between public and private. Uh, and when we look at uh, uh, contemporary media, the, those unanticipated audiences uh, and, um, and obscurity of production are even more striking if, in a way. Unanticipated audiences could mean um, uh, anything from the ability of that 47% video to go viral and transform the, uh, the last election to um, uh, much less desirable uh, possibilities of surveillance and, uh, and integration. So um, publicness produces solidarities and collective agencies, but it also produces vulnerabilities. And this was an important theme in Craig's paper was the, um, the possibility of involuntary publicness, which is always there. So uh, when Habermas talks about disregarding status, uh, something that uh, all, was also widely discussed as bracketing uh, in the um, late 80s and early 90s. We might retranslate that language as, uh, as partly being about obscurity. Um, and uh, of course, in contemporary media, most of the content that people are producing and consuming is, um, is not exactly anonymous or untraceable in the way that uh, so much of that early 18th century print discourse was. In fact, a lot of it is um, what the contemporary media theorists are calling anonymous content. That is, you, uh, this, I don't know where this back formation came from, but you just take the A off of anonymous and, uh, and you notice that people are now consuming and producing huge amounts of material about themselves um, in social media particularly. And um, there are a great number of ways that their uh, production of anonymous content can be either related to or buffered against the norms of offline environments. Now this is critical because um, the movement of our ordinary subjectivity and our, and our uh, public consciousness into these digital environments has created a lot of uh, really uh, regressive uh, potential. So uh, for example, the Tampa police um, use uh, face recognition technology to uh, identify everybody who attended football games in Tampa. And when someone tried to bring uh, an action against them uh, in the name of a right to privacy, their argument was that when people go into a public space, such as a football stadium, stadium they forfeit any reasonable expectation of privacy. This is a beautiful illustration of uh, not only the incoherence of our public-private distinction, my way of putting it, of course Craig had a, uh, a great critique of it as well, my way of putting it is that there are so many uh, historical layers of meaning in both of these terms that everything you want to call public in one sense is private in another sense and vice versa. Um, courts are not very good at making those distinctions um, and um, they're particularly not good at, at understanding how we might want to be uh, public in some ways and, and yet 
buffer ourselves against the possibilities of surveillance or norm integration that, uh, that are increasingly uh, the conditions of publicness at all. So online publicness is significantly different from print or, or electronic broadcast forms uh, in that acts of attention and uptake themselves become measurable and traceable uh, and factors in the public sphere. So think about uh, data mining. Every time uh, you do something online, it becomes uh, part of the uh, interaction, uh, part of the base for algorithms uh, that future people will encounter. I've actually seen an argument that uh, that there ought to be something like royalty structures for, uh, uh, for the way, let's say, uh, online dating services use your own interaction with them as the data that will um, uh, show up in algorithms for future users. Uh, so that, you know, you see, the, you see how that argument goes. Or searchability, um, you can, uh, of course, now trace almost everything we do uh, online, unless you're very, very clever at covering your tracks. Um, all websites now think about strategies of, uh, of hit maximization. Everything is, um, is uh, the, the prestige and prominence of your site on search engines depends on how many hits you get, and therefore people have all kinds of architectural um, devices and rhetorics for uh, getting you to click around on their site. Um, uh, it's a part of the incentive structures and design management that Craig was worried about in general in, in contemporary publicness, but it's right there in the media infrastructure of our inter, inter, interactivity. Um, and this creates, of course, a kind of constant awareness in online interaction of a kind of normativity of the mass. That is, uh, we are never entirely unaware of the, that large-scale field of interaction and the way it precipitates value. We're never entirely um, unaware of the potential for involuntary anonymity, uh, if you see what I mean. So um, again, this is a way of, emphasize, of underscoring what, uh, what Craig was saying when he remarked that there is no democracy at the level we care about that is based in transparency. Um, but this is true for better and worse. Um, it's it, the, the lack of transparency, the uh, ways that we have of producing obscurity <clears throat> uh, can in many ways be really enabling. And, uh, and here the, 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 the great problem we face in this room is that we don't have enough uh, teenagers present um, because Teenagers, I, you know, teenagers are very, very skilled at producing obscurity. Uh, Dana Boyd has written uh, very well about um, about what she calls network publics and the strategies that uh, that young people have devised for um, not only avoiding their parents' recognition, but also uh, buffering. Uh, uh, through n not just through um, pseudonymous profiles, um, but also through various rhetorical strategies of obscurity, so that uh, there are codes, there are ways of communicating through pictures or through um, uh, uh, jargons that are inaccessible to uh, undesirable audiences, and so on. Um, it's actually it's an art of ordinary life in modernity to be able to produce obscurity. Uh, and, and, um, and yet we are continually being uh, outfoxed or outflanked in that struggle by um, promotional culture, management, incentivization, the language of choice architecture. Uh, and I think that's going to produce an enormous uh, problem uh, in the imagination of democracy uh, going forward. You can already see it in the way uh, there are new arguments for benign paternalism uh, in, uh, uh, in opposition to uh, the history of the harm principle and so on. So um, I, that problem, that is the problem of how we can maintain the um, uh, the con conditions of obscurity that are essential to freedom in public and essential to uh, um, our 
ability to, to have some control over the conditions of our own publicness um, is, uh, is one side of the problem, and almost the opposite side of the problem is uh, that issue of connectivity on a scale that has no public to match it, because the uh, um, most common uh, solutions to that problem have to do with greater and greater integration and greater and greater transparency. So Gavin Newsom has this new book called Citizenville in which he argues that uh, online environments are uh, enormously productive for new forms of democracy and, uh, and citizen action uh, from everything from keeping track of potholes to uh, um, uh, forming new kinds of collectivities. Um, and he sort of waves away the problem of norm integration and uh, involuntary publicness or involuntary anonymity. Um, the message is simply don't do bad things because uh, anything that people might disapprove of is more and more uh, visible uh, in the integration of online environments. I think that is the, the worst possible path. For, uh, for future democracies in uh, the immediate environment we face. And so maybe I'll just stop there. Yes. Well, um, since I was the one who, who said aesthetic. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, mean that to be a personal comment. Um, I wanted to take that word back immediately when it you know, somehow popped out of my mouth. I was actually talking about the sociality of art form. Yeah. And about the possibility that they contribute some significant and necessary things to the creation of change in the creation of culture um, in ways that, that you know I think you've worked on too. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you though about obscurity. Yeah. Um, it, it struck me when you were laying that out that, that it's it's not the same thing as the, the sociality of strangers. Of, of, of the no, right, right, because we produce it, obscurity but, and but it's, but intimacy. It's, it's another genre of, of um, something like that that produces a certain kind of unanticipated, un, uh, uncontainable aspect that's, that's also a, uh, a, an incentive or a catalyst for for, for uh, thinking beyond, hmm? you know, an audience. Exactly. Thinking, thinking, thinking to the non-audience. Right. You know, the, right. Yeah. Right. And do you see those two? Beautifully put. Okay. So you're thinking, uh, particularly of artistic practice there. So uh, not. You, you, that is, you're, you're interested in the way uh, a lot of artistic practice is specifically trying to concretize or imagine mm -hmm. uh, forms of uh, uptake, sociability, experience that are not yet those that we recognize in, in publics. Is that, yeah, is as, that what you're saying? Yeah, as, as in a sense, a, another way of thinking about the social uh, for, the, for the consumer um, that isn't rational, critical, yeah. but provides a, a, a mode, it's not language even necessarily, a mode uh, of thinking about things that aren't really accessible in the rational way. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that right. Right, no, that's true. And uh, although I think one should also say the rational critical isn't rational critical. That is to say that, uh, that you can't really separate out rational critical discourse um, and give it that kind of categorical uh, prestige in the way that Habermas's analysis wants to do. There is a poetic function uh, in anything that counts as rational critical. And, uh, and that's something that, that is uh, just as important to theorize and has many of the same, sometimes has many of the same anticipatory qualities. Yeah. That you're describing. And, and that's, I think, why reading the novel Habermas yeah. is such a central aspect of the development of that new subjectivity that allows the bourgeois public sphere to come into existence. Yeah. Um, much, he spends much 
which is an oddity about that in Habermas is that that appears entirely under the heading preparation for the public sphere mm -hmm. and not participation yeah. Yeah. in it. So mm -hmm. both historically, it's in his discussion of how collectively we get ready to have a public sphere. We do it by reading novels and participating in, in Pluton critical reviews and literary discussion. Once we have his political public sphere, that drops out entirely. Um, so there's no continuing role for that kind of um, cultural engagement, for interpenetration between that and the political, or for continued remaking of the person and the collectivity in the public. So it becomes remarkably statically political once it's the political public sphere, even though there was that very interesting earlier discussion. Um, you know, it occurs to me that, uh, that one thing I forgot to mention um, is about obscurity, a couple things. One is that the, the language has come from, um, from uh, security through obscurity is the original form of this, uh, of this phrase, and it came from uh, software designers who are looking for uh, ways of avoiding being hacked or, or traced, and so they came up with a variety of devices to make uh, their code less readable. Uh, and that turned out to be a very limited strategy for providing online security, but, um, but it, it was for a long time very effective. And so privacy through obscurity is, is in a way modeled on, on that idea. But uh, if, if one thinks in a broader way about the history of, of, the, of the aspiration to obscurity, um, it's been there for a long time. And it's also essential to the difference between a counterpublic and a public. Um, so, uh, I have learned a good deal from Craig, but Craig and I have a long um, going conversation about how meaningful it is to distinguish between a counter public and a public. Craig at one point asked me whether all counter publics weren't just multiple publics. That was the language, uh, that was a kind of uh, liberal language that was going around uh, in the initial reception of, of Habermas's theory. And I, um, and I resisted that. Uh, simple pluralization of publics because it seems to me that there's a very critical power relation that uh, is uh, experienced as a threshold of entry. So some uh, spheres of interaction are obscure with relation to the general public by, the, by virtue of the very things that also make them dominated, uh, environments of stigma uh, and so on, that uh, that inadvertently allow, I don't think dominant culture ever had this intention, but because once you get these forms of domination and stigma um, and hierarchy in place, they have a, an inadvertent consequence, which is that interactivity in the spaces constituted by stigma is, uh, is relatively obscure to the dominant public. So these are places where people can have um, mutual display and some sense of collective belonging and, and even historical agency um, marked by a relation of antagonism uh, from the beginning. However, um, uh, Craig has been very uh, uh, illuminating about the constant oscillation that, uh, that sets up between the counterpublic and public uh, relation. Counterpublics tend to aspire at some level to uh, publicness in the more uh, general sense, and um, hi under shifting historical conditions can very quickly flip over. Um, so Craig in Roots of Radicalism has great examples about how um, people in various social movement contexts can speak at one, in, in one setting or one moment in a counter-public way and then um, immediately flip over uh, in the, into the rhetoric of the dominant public, and gay marriage is a beautiful example of that. Um, what has happened in the last 20 years has been uh, uh, the kind of erosion of the conditions of counter-publicity, for better and worse, um, uh, and the worse has to do with uh, you know, the way the uh, influx of large-scale political organizations like the HRC um, the increasing power of, of uh, money and donors uh, in that context, the uh, um, increasing attention to um, 
issues like military service and marriage in national media meant that the whole conversation about what gay people want shifted over into the dominant public. And, uh, and at the same time, the conditions of counter-public uh, belonging uh, suffered a good deal of erosion. So those uh, local community newspapers got re uh, died out, got replaced. Local street organizations got subsumed, in many cases very aggressively replaced and eliminated by um, the HRC. Uh, and, um, and so I think many, uh, this has been so effective and such a uh, dramatic transformation over the last 20 years that uh, young queer people no longer really have a sense that, the, many of them, no longer have a sense that the gay movement ever aspired to anything other than, uh, than marriage. And that's, that's uh, a sign of the of the conditions under which they come to understand themselves as gay people or as belonging. Increasingly, that's mediated to them through things like um, uh, television uh, uh, sitcoms and uh, film and uh, national public conversations, rather than through things like um, dance clubs, local gay bars, street activist organizations, community newspapers, and the like. Um, so. Uh, things that look like uh, counter-public one moment can very easily be described as the public sphere in the next moment. George. It seems like one of the uh, insights that Craig is also pushing us to with his chapter in, in the article in SSR, SSHA, Social Science History, um, the integration of public and counter-public sphere theory with Borgesian field theory yeah. is, is worth exploring here because one of the distinctive features about the field as opposed to public, or maybe like the public, is that there's a kind of a possibility of universal inspection of all by all. Yeah. Otherwise, the, the hierarchies of distinction don't work. And so if the dominated are completely invisible, they're not even part of the field, as it were, because they have to be classified somehow or other, both by themselves and by others. And so it would be interesting to know whether subfield would be a category uh -huh. that would allow them to still be inspected, and counterfield or counterpublic would be one in which they would perhaps would only be inspectable by one another. And then even within that, your ideas of total obscurity through, you know, um, online online personas that can't even be seen by others would be some third thing. Yeah. So it seems like there's a nested or uh, a set of less and less inspectable or visible types. Of well, you know, but you're right. Systems, I mean, microsystems. That that's an interesting way of putting it. We of course we're all of us getting continually more and more inspectable. Uh, and um, and even uh, this is what I, the irony is that even our <clears throat> our interactivity makes us more inspectable. Even if you go on, uh, uh, in, in some ways, I mean, inspectable means a variety of things here. Uh, it means it doesn't just mean identifiable. Um, I, as you say, you, you, people are their people's inspectability is part of the part of the way we can characterize the field, um, whether they are active participants in it or empowered in it or not. Uh -huh.